Well, I want to encourage you to take out your Bibles in the New Testament, be turning to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to begin with a passage of Scripture here in Ephesians 3, and then we are going to move forward with our study of the major doctrines of Scripture as they are organized and summarized in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So we've had a couple of weeks that we have kind of had a break from this series. We were blessed last week to have Brother Jerry Bridges with us, and actually his lesson uh, uh, created some... um, Uh, some question in my mind as to whether we needed to immediately jump back into this series because chapter 3 of the confession that we're beginning this evening concerns God's eternal decree, which is basically an extended discussion of God's sovereignty. And of course, that's what Brother Bridges uh, led us in a study of last week. But ultimately, I decided that, that this material, I hope, will dovetail nicely and maybe it allow us to take kind of the next step, as it were, in thinking more seriously about these things. So if you feel like, wow, all of the preaching lately has been about the sovereignty of God, well, there is some truth to that. Of course, that's almost always going to be the case when we're teaching Scripture uh, in a comprehensive manner. But, but even more than usual, perhaps, we're giving some attention to that theme right now. But I would say that that's... Providential. That wasn't necessarily the schedule that we had originally laid out, but by God's grace, that is what we have been able to enjoy. So tonight we're talking about the eternal decree, and there is no passage of Scripture that I would rather uh, teach out of, at least as pertains this topic, than the first half of Ephesians chapter 3. The eternal decree is really what sets Reformed theology apart. It is a unifying principle that is not unique to Reformed theology, but more than any other theology, more than any other approach to God or theological point of view, this idea that there is an eternal decree by God which unites all things really does give a coherence to the Reformed tradition that I can tell you from experience is lacking in many other traditions. When you ask the question, why did God create? Why did the fall occur? What is the ultimate purpose of redemptive history? All of those questions have to be answered biblically by appealing to the idea of this eternal decree. And I want to say that even though that terminology may not be familiar to all of you, some of you may think, well, I've, I've been in church all my life. I've never heard of the eternal decree. Well, if you're coming from outside of the Reformed tradition, that may, in fact, be the case. But what I hope I can show you this evening is that the eternal decree, that idea, is woven through the entire fabric of Scripture. And yet, unfortunately, many believers have never really seriously thought about it. I have suggested before in this series that the Uh, organization of the Westminster Confession of Faith is significant. I think it's significant that the Westminster divines in the 17th century chose to begin the confession by talking about the doctrine of Scripture because this sets the table, as it were, for true knowledge. And then next to talk about the doctrine of God because we have to know who God is in order to understand everything else that follows from that in theology. And I think it is significant that the decree comes next, that the eternal decree is discussed before creation, before providence, and before the fall. And it's not the only order that those topics could be studied in. You, you could study all of these topics in some other arrangement. But what I am hoping is that you and I will benefit from the orderly arrangement that is actually in the confession, because I think there is a logic to it. Let's turn to Scripture here now. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through 13 as we begin our study together. Listen carefully to what God has said in His Word. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel." 
of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church... The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that He has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. This is fascinating. Ephesians is the most theologically dense letter in the New Testament. It's the most theologically dense book in the entire Bible. In the first three chapters, that is particularly the case. But Ephesians is one of Paul's prison letters. He has been incarcerated. If this is written near the end of his Roman imprisonment, as most scholars think, he has been incarcerated for the better part of four years. He has been arrested in Jerusalem, transported to Caesarea where he stayed for two years, now transported to Rome where he's been another two years, and largely the charge is due to his ministry among the Gentiles. The Jews were enraged at Jerusalem because of Paul's uh, affiliation, if you will, his fellowship with Gentiles. And so in a very real sense, Paul's imprisonment is for the Gentile believers in Ephesus and in other places where he has worked. And Paul spends this, this extended period of the letter discussing this eternal purpose that God has hidden in a mystery for ages, but now has been revealed through the preaching of the gospel and how magnificent that eternal purpose is. And then he gets exceptionally practical, exceptionally pastoral in how that doctrine of the eternal decree, the eternal purpose should work out in our lives. And the specific application he makes is there in verse 13. He says, because this is so, I ask you not to lose heart at my sufferings for you, because my suffering is for your glory. Can you imagine how the Ephesians must have felt? There were Jews from Asia Minor. Ephesus is the major city in Asia Minor. Jews from Asia Minor that originally make the charges against Paul in the city of Jerusalem that lead to him nearly being beaten to death by a mob and then incarcerated for four years and maybe longer. The Ephesian brethren know that it is some of their neighbors that put Paul where he is today. They know that Paul has risked his life countless times, nearly been killed multiple times, and is now incarcerated largely because he has devoted his life to preaching the gospel to them. How would you feel about that? Do you like it when other people suffer for you? When other people experience harm or difficulty because they're serving you? I don't like that. That makes me self-conscious. I wish it weren't the case. I would much rather suffer for myself than see someone else encounter difficulty or trouble because of me. And Paul says, in view of this doctrine of the eternal decree, I would like you to stop feeling bad about this. And recognize that this was ordained by God for your glory and for His. That is how important this doctrine is. That is how important what we're about to begin studying really is. And the implications of it are much farther reaching than just that. We are not going to get very far tonight, but we're going to lay some very important groundwork. There are three ideas here in Ephesians chapter 3 I want to point out to you before we move any further in our study this evening. These are ideas that we will be circling back to as we proceed. Number one, the gospel is the revelation of a mystery relating to an eternal purpose that is accomplished in Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. The gospel, Paul says, is the revelation of a mystery that relates to an eternal purpose that is accomplished in Christ Jesus. You notice the ideas of gospel, mystery, revelation, and this eternal purpose in verse 11 are tightly woven in this unit of Scripture. Paul is arguing that the inclusion of the Gentiles in the body of Christ was not plan B. That the church is not an alternate option. But that what is happening right now was always the plan. Not just from the beginning, but from eternity. Number two, 
The eternal purpose is worked out in the context of creation, revelation, and salvation. That's what Paul says, verses 8 through 11 particularly. He refers to creation, revelation, and redemption as a means of describing the outworkings of this eternal plan. Look again at verse 8. Paul says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, that redeemed body, that redeemed group of people, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. We've made this point before, but let me make it again. Notice that Paul's point is not about local or personal evangelism. Local and personal evangelism is, is, is important. It's something that we should emphasize. It's something that we should engage in as much as we have opportunity. It's just not the point here. When he says the church makes known this manifold wisdom of God, he says they're making it known to the spiritual forces, to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This is not about sharing the gospel with your neighbor. This is about the church being the manifestation of God's wisdom. And that is worked out in the redemption of that people. What God decreed to do in Christ predates creation, but it wasn't fully revealed, Paul says, until after the cross. It was hidden for ages in God. But now is made known, verses 4 through 6. And third, the eternal purpose is the governing principle behind all of God's acts and human history. The church is the outcome of God's plan. The church is not the alternative to God's plan. It is not the backup to God's plan. It is the outcome of God's plan. The manifestation of His multifaceted wisdom. And Paul says, I was made a steward of this truth sent by God's power to proclaim God's perfect work in Christ. And that eternal purpose is guiding all of that. It's guiding creation. It's guiding revelation. It's guiding redemption. It's guiding all things. And we'll see how Scripture develops that idea this evening. Let's turn now to the Westminster Confession for a moment and see how this idea has been taken up and summarized in this document from the uh, uh, 17th century. This, again, is printed in the back of your hymnal if you'd like to follow along there. We're in chapter 3 and looking at Articles 1 and 2, and I might mention that we're going to look at Articles 1 and 2 next week as well. God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of His own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. That's the eternal decree. That's the foundation of it. There's more that flows from that. There's more that corresponds to that. But that's the basic idea. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of His own will, freely, He's not under compulsion, and unchangeably, nothing's going to thwart this or reroute this, Ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet, yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Now we're going to unpack what that means. But he's saying the fact that God has ordained all that ever will be, does not change the fact that there are real decisions being made freely by the creatures. That there are secondary causes that are producing results, and yet all of it under the sovereign ordination of God. And then Article 2. Although God knows whatsoever may or can come to pass upon all supposed conditions, yet hath He not decreed anything because He foresaw it as future, or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions. That is an explicit denial that God's foreordination, that God's predestination is based on simple foresight. And I realize that a lot of people believe that's exactly how predestination works. They are more than willing to say, I believe in predestination, I believe in God's foreordination. And yet what they mean is, I believe that God decided to do exactly what He knew would eventually happen. 
which logically, by the way, makes no sense, but even apart from the logical problems with it, biblically, it's not supportable. And that will be part of the burden tonight and next week. G.I. Williamson in his study guide to the Westminster Confession gives a really excellent summary of what is contained in these first two articles of chapter 3. He said, this section of the Confession teaches us, one, that God has predetermined all things that happen. Two, that this predetermination, this plan is eternal. Three, that there is nothing too large or small to be excluded from this predetermination. Four, that this does not make God the author of sin. Five, that God does not force men to do what they do not want to do in the way of sin. Six, that this does not destroy freedom or cause and affect relationships. Rather, it is the very basis upon which these exist. And finally, seven, that this sovereign plan of God is not conditioned upon anything foreseen by Him which would make God dependent upon something outside Himself. That's a really good summary. That's seven points that you can take and just meditate upon and look at the proof text in the confession and go back and forth between Scripture and then why are they summarizing this in this way? Where are these ideas coming from? That's a really helpful summary. And I want to try and, and, and build upon that and give you some additional things to think about. I didn't originally plan it this way, but as I was laying out categories of information that we needed to cover tonight, it ended up being several sets of three so that may seem um, a little arbitrary, but originally it wasn't sets of three. It just kind of eventually uh, condensed into that. Let's talk about this sovereign decree of God here for a few minutes. Go in the Old Testament to Isaiah 46. I want to uh, read with you some other passages on these, I, on these points, and yet we're not going to even scratch the surface of Scripture that speaks to this idea. I want to give you a few texts that you'll be able to take home with you and really think about. Three affirmations to start on this decree of God. Number one is that God has foreordained everything that will ever happen. That's what the confession is saying. And if I understand scripture correctly, that's what scripture says, which is why the Westminster Confession reads the way it does. Isaiah 46, beginning at verse 8, the Lord speaking against the false gods of the day, says this, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Now that passage of scripture takes a turn that you might not expect. When the Lord says, I am God and there is no other and I, uh, I can tell you the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that have, have not yet happened, we say, well, of course you can. You're God. You know everything. Of course you have prophetic foresight the ability to predict the future, of course you can do that, you're God. And he says, yes, but I can do that because I'm the one who appointed what was going to happen. Notice what he says. Saying, verse 10, my counsel shall stand. He's not saying this is what's going to happen. He's saying this is what I have ordained to happen. My counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. He's not predicting the future. He is promising what he's going to do. And that includes not just the positive aspects of salvation that we might attribute to God's foreordination. No, in verse 11, it speaks of the judgment of Israel. That's what he's talking about. That's the context here. Here the, the nation is caught between two superpowers, Assyria in the north, Egypt in the south, and these two armies are vying against one another for supremacy of the region that Israel is occupying. And the Lord says what's about to happen is going to happen because I called the bird of prey. Because I called the enemies in. Because I appointed all of these things. You could look at the larger context and see exactly how that works out. But make no mistake, God is saying that even though... There are many things that do happen in our world that are contrary to God's commands. Nothing happens contrary to His 
ultimate will. It just can't. It can't happen. You say, you mean that God intended for all of these evil things to be done? What I'm saying is none of these evil things could have ever been done unless God had ordained that it would be so. He could have put an end to any of it and all of it. And yet he has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. A second affirmation on this point, and that is that human beings are responsible for their actions. I'm not even going to read any passages of Scripture at this point. Just point you to a few from your memory banks. Ephesians chapter 2. How does Paul describe our condition outside of Christ prior to God's grace coming to rescue us? He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once conducted ourselves, listen to what he says, in the lusts of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of who? Our, our desires, the desires of our flesh, the desires of our mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Human beings are responsible for their actions, you say, but, but human beings sin, and you're saying that God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. So at least at some level, God has ordained even my sin. Yes, that doesn't change the fact that when you sin, you're a sinner and you're responsible for it. Could God have stopped you from sinning? Of course He could have. He could have killed you in the womb. He didn't. He could have kept you back from the temptations that you and I have fallen into so often. He did not. Does that mean God is responsible for my sin? Not at all. I am responsible for my sin. I'm fulfilling the desires of my flesh, the desires of my mind. I am a children, child of wrath by choice until God chooses to come and rescue me. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. And we want to say, why? <laughs> why, Lord, do offenses have to come? He says offenses must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. Somebody was going to betray Christ. That somebody was Judas. Jesus says in John chapter 17, it would have been better if he had never been born. That brings us to our third affirmation, and that is this. Man freely chooses, but the Lord sovereignly ordains and disposes. That is nowhere better illustrated than in the story of Judas. If you have time, go through the Gospel of John. Look particularly at chapter 6, chapter 13, and chapter 17. Let me say that again. John chapter 6, chapter 13, and chapter 17. And watch the way that the fourth gospel tells this story. Is Judas foreordained as the betrayer? Of course he is. And who is animating Judas? It's not God, it's Satan. And who is responsible for Judas' sin? It's Judas. Man freely chooses, willingly chooses. God does not have our arm twisted up behind our back in some kind of a hammer lock forcing us to do evil. We are running headlong into evil. God is the one restraining us from being as evil as we want to be. Go back to the New Testament for a minute to the book of Acts. We will look at a couple of verses here. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost with the other apostles. He's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. Listen to how he describes this event. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You people of Jerusalem are responsible. You crucified the Son of God. But he only fell into your hands because that was God's plan all along. It was the definite plan of God. We'll come back to this before we're done. But it's not enough to say God permitted it. It's true to say God permitted it, but it's not enough to say God permitted it. God had a definite plan that it was going to happen. Go over to chapter 4. The book of Acts still, chapter 4. Look at verses 26 through 28. Peter and John have been arrested, threatened, Warned not to preach anymore. They go back. They report these things to the church. The church prays. That's the way the church is supposed to respond to threats of violence and danger. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 26. In their prayer, they are appealing to Psalm 2. They're quoting from the Psalms and saying, This is exactly what you said would be done. Verse 26. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. For truly... In this city, 
They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Jesus had a lot of enemies. Herod slaughters infants in Bethlehem, trying to kill him while he's a child. Herod Antipas is a fox, Jesus says. And he doesn't mean that in a complimentary way. He's a fox who has John the Baptist beheaded and longs to get an audience with Jesus. Pilate. Pilate condemns Jesus to death knowing that he's innocent. The chief priests are complicit. They're standing at the foot of the cross mocking this man as he dies. And the apostles and brethren in Acts chapter 4 say, And all along, all of these evil people who are willingly doing these wicked things are doing what God Predestined to do all along. Whatever you had already determined. Clearly the apostles didn't understand that it was the plan at the time. But they have come to understand that now. Let's talk about three truths with regard to this purpose of God. And for this I'm going to appeal back to a passage that we read at the beginning. Ephesians 3 and verse 11. The first point is that God's purpose is eternal. That's what Paul says. This is according to the eternal purpose of God, which he accomplished in Jesus Christ. Now think about that for a second. We've studied the concept of eternity in relation to the doctrine of God. And and included in that idea of eternal is that idea of unchanging, right? God is not reworking his plan as human history develops. He did not decide what to do about sin after the fall. It's not as though he puts Adam and Eve in the garden and then they eat the forbidden fruit and the Lord says, well, I didn't see that coming. What am I going to do about that? How are we going to handle this? No, this is an eternal purpose, folks. God's purpose in Christ Jesus has no beginning in time and will never have an end. That is, quite honestly, just reflecting on that point in preparation for this lesson. Was, was once again mind-boggling. How can it be an eternal purpose? It stretches from eternity to eternity. This is not something that God came up with inside space and time. The second point about this purpose is that it is unchangeable. And even if you question whether the, the word eternal can really carry that kind of freight, go over to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Verses 17 and 18. Listen to what the Hebrews writer says about this eternal purpose of God. When God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement To hold fast to the hope set before us. Again, look at the pastoral implications. Look at the practical implications of an eternal decree. The Hebrews writer says, God's unchangeable purpose is secured by an oath. How strong is an oath for a person who who can't lie? I mean, it's not like God has to take an oath here. For him to simply speak this is true. It makes it true. And yet the Lord says, let me show you how serious I am about this. I am going to put myself under oath. He binds himself to the terms of the covenant. Genesis chapter 15, these animals are slaughtered and laid on opposite sides. The Lord representatively walks through the pieces by himself. He brings himself under the curse. He will fulfill the promise. And the Hebrews writer says, we can have great encouragement, strong consolation. This is not only an eternal purpose, it's an unchangeable one. He will never change his mind, and therefore our election is secure. And number three, God's purpose is effectual. Go back to Ephesians for just a minute. Go back to chapter 1, though, this time. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and how Paul describes this in verse 11. This is in the section where he's enumerating all of these spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. Notice what he says, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. In Him, that is in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Now just 
Just rest in that for a minute. Paul doesn't say, well, it's possible that we will have an inheritance. Some of you might obtain the inheritance if you're good. He says, in Christ, we have already obtained our inheritance. Well, how can you be so certain, Paul? Because it is secured by God's predestination. Well, there's all kinds of things that I determine beforehand that I'm going to do. I mean, that every day, right? I make out my to-do list. I determine beforehand what is going to be. Rarely does the day go exactly as I determined that it was going to be. Really can't call it predetermination, right? Pre-planning and then adaptation, right? But when God predetermines something, when He predestines something, Paul says He works all things according to the counsel of His will. In other words, He works everything around that purpose. According to that purpose. That's why we said earlier that this eternal decree, this eternal purpose in Christ Jesus that becomes a decree that is enacted in space and time, that eternal decree is the governing principle behind all of God's actions in human history. Why did anything occur? Why does everything occur? It happens because God ordained it to be so. Because He, in His perfect wisdom and in His unchanging purpose, has determined this is the way that my purpose will be worked out in space and time. God's decree is not a meaningless declaration of desire. It actually accomplishes what He ordains will be. Let me give you an example of that. In Galatians chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, but in Galatians chapter 1, Paul is recounting his conversion. And he reminds his readers... That God set him apart from his mother's womb. You remember Saul of Tarsus being a very faithful Christian from his mother's womb? See, I don't remember that part of the story. I remember Saul of Tarsus advancing in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries. I remember Saul of Tarsus persecuting the church. I remember Saul of Tarsus standing by and watching Stephen being stoned to death and giving his consent to it. And Paul says... But actually, God had set me apart from my mother's womb for the ministry of gospel preaching. Do you think Saul of Tarsus resisted that will of God? Of course he did. For a while. Until God decided that he wasn't going to anymore. And then he stopped resisting. And God knocked him in the dirt and said, go preach. And Paul did. That is the difference between the general call and the effectual call, which we'll come to later in our study. Not tonight, but in, like, later in the year. That's the difference between the general call and the effectual call. That's the difference between saying, Come, all who desire, all who will, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a general call, right? Jesus doesn't generally call Paul. He goes and gets him. He knocks him down. He says, stop and go preach. And Paul does. God's purpose is effectual. It accomplishes what is intended. Now, let's think about three types of knowledge that God has and how they relate to this decree very quickly. The confession says that God's knowledge, God's decree rather, is not based on his pre-knowledge of how things will be or how things might be. And I believe that that is completely faithful to Scripture. We know that God knows everything that will occur. Right? I, I hope we know that. If you don't know that, then I would have to tell you I don't think that you're a Christian. You're an open theist and that's something else. Right? If, if you believe that God knows everything that is knowable, but the future free will choices of man are not knowable because they are not yet actualized, you're not a Christian. You need to repent and believe the gospel. But I don't think there's anybody here in that category right now. God knows everything that's ever going to occur. Right? Because he's God, he's not bound by space and time, he's not limited, he's infinite. But that is not the basis of his decree. Do you remember Isaiah 46 that we read a few minutes ago, verse 11? He's saying, my counsel will stand. I've called them and they're coming. I will accomplish the purpose that I have established. Now, which is prior? God's foresight of what will happen, His pre-knowledge of what's going to occur, or the purpose that it occur. It's the purpose that precedes it. 
Let me prove this to you another way. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, John says, We love Him because He first loved us. If God chooses His people based upon His prior knowledge that they will love Him, that verse is not true. You think about it for a second. That verse says, we love Him because He first loved us. Not only does His love happen first in time, but it is also the cause producing the effect of our love. Now, if God has chosen His people based upon His prior knowledge that certain people are going to love Him, and He says, well, I'm looking down through the corridors of time. I see that Charlie's going to love me, and so I'm, I'm going to set my love on Charlie. Well, then... God's love will be first in time, but it will not be the cause producing the effect. It cannot be. In fact, Charlie's love, logically, is the cause producing the effect of God's love in that system. Right? But that's not what the Bible teaches, that we love Him because He first loved us. This, by the way, in terms of coming to appreciate the doctrines of grace, was was the breaking point for me. Go, go over in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 1. Let me show you a, a verse of Scripture that just rocked my world. This was not the only verse of Scripture that God used to open my eyes to these things and to change my mind about these things. I was corresponding very briefly with several um, leading Armenian scholars, including very briefly with Jack Cottrell. And uh, here, are, here are brothers in Christ who believe that God's election is not individual and unconditional, but that God chooses people based upon His foresight that they will, if presented the gospel, they will choose to believe. I'm trying to reconcile this with Scripture, and I'm having very little luck. I guess it's appropriate to use luck there, because that's, <laughs> God's not going to predetermine that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm having no success. Let's put it that way. And finally, I, I, I talked to one of those men, Dr. Cottrell, and I said, if a person believes in Christ for a time and then falls away, was that person elect? Was that person chosen by God before the foundation of the world? And he, he said, well, no, of course he wouldn't be because God would foresee not only that they would believe at a point in time, but he would foresee whether they would persevere or not. And he's not going to choose someone who is going to stop believing and be lost. Well, that makes sense from his system. But here's the problem. That then means that God's choice is based upon their works of perseverance. Because, see, that's what perseverance looks like, folks. It looks like obeying Christ. It looks like pursuing holiness. It looks like being fruitful, right? Being faithful until death. But if that's the basis of God's election, you have an election based on works. And that is explicitly contraindicated by Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 Paul says, He saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. It was His purpose. It was His grace. And He gave it to you before you were born. Before He said, let there be light, He wrote names down in a book. If you're a believer in Jesus, your name was one of those. He does not decree what will be based on what he foresees will be. Nor does he decree based on what could potentially be. This relates to something called middle knowledge. And at the time that the Westminster Confession was being written, middle knowledge was becoming a real threat to orthodoxy. It actually continues to be today. A lot of very influential evangelicals subscribe to a point of view called Molinism. Molinism is the idea that God has ordained things according to his knowledge of potential outcomes. God knows how things would turn out no matter which way he chooses to go. This would be like, this is a crude example, but I think it's an, a sufficient one. It's like playing chess. You, you could know, if you were intelligent enough, every potential move in every chess game. 
Every single one, you could do the math. I mean, that's just a math problem. That's all it is. And you could say, I can map out every possibility for any game of chess that will ever be played. And then middle knowledge is the idea that God, having that knowledge of potential outcomes, Molinism says, God ordained things in this way to create the best possible outcome. You know, maybe he'd like to have done better, but this is the best of all potential outcomes. And of course, that's why we have evil. That's why we have sin. That's why we have sickness. That's why we have uh, violence. It, it, it would, we'd like for it to be different, but, but God has chosen the path that is the best of all possible outcomes. Anything else would have been worse. Well, that's an entertaining idea. It's just not a biblical one. Here's the reality. The Bible does describe middle knowledge, and God does, in fact, have it. Let me give you two examples quickly. 1 Samuel chapter 23, David is uh, in the wilderness. He's on the run. He's a fugitive from King Saul. He hears that the city of Kilah has been attacked by the Philistines. Now, that's Saul's job to take care of. But David is a man of God, and he's a patriot, and he wants to protect the people of Kilah. And so he asks the Lord, he says, If I go and fight at Kilah, and I stay there, are the people of the city going to hand me over to Saul? And the Lord says, Yep. Now, guess what? David goes and fights at Kila, rescues the city, and leaves. <laughs> he doesn't stay. You say, well, how could God know that they would do that? Because God knows everything. He knows the potential outcome. Let me give you another example. Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works that have been done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in dust and ash uh, in yeah, dust and sackcloth, ashes and sackcloth long ago. My mind's blanking. But anyway, potential outcome. Jesus just says, if Tyre and Sidon had seen the miracles that Jesus performed in Chorazin and Bethsaida, they would have repented. God, for whatever reason, did not choose to send them a prophet to perform those mighty acts in those cities. God has middle knowledge. He knows everything that could ever happen under any given circumstances. But if that knowledge is the basis of God's decree, then man's actions determine outcomes and God is not ultimate. So that's the reality. If you don't believe in the eternal decree, God is not sovereign. Man is. Man is in control. I'm not in control of everything, but I am in control at least of the future of this world. That is within my sphere of power and influence. God is not ultimate if his decree is based on knowledge. Now, God's decree is based on God's determined knowledge. What he has decided will be. And it will be because he decided it. That's how he knows the future. Is not just looking down through the corridors of time, not just playing the chess game saying, if I move the piece this way, then my opponent is going to respond in this way, and that will allow me to do this. He's not playing chess. He is determining outcomes. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to finish on this point. But before we finish, I want you to look at two chapters in Revelation. They're very short chapters. But I want you to listen to Revelation and see how... God's sovereign decree is worked out. When I was wrestling with the doctrines of grace, I think I've mentioned before, I was teaching a number of different classes, but two of the classes I was teaching there, during that time, were one was on the book of Genesis, one was on the book of Revelation. I thought, I'm safe here. You know, I've got all these questions about this Calvinism, right? I don't want to go anywhere near Romans right now. I don't want to go near Ephesians. I want to be careful about the Gospel of John. But I feel safe in Revelation and Genesis. I mean, the bookends of the Bible, they don't have anything to do with Calvinism and Arminianism, right? Wrecked me. Just wrecked me. Those two books hit me between the eyes so many times with the sovereignty of God that I finally threw up my hands, called my friend, and said, either Calvinism is true or the Bible is not. And what I meant was, either God is sovereign or there is no God. You might as well quit this charade. You're either going to believe in God the way that the Bible presents Him, or you're going to stop pretending to believe in God at all. Because there is no other God that exists. And let me show you two of the chapters that made me think that way in Revelation. One is chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, 
the Lord is pulling the curtain back, as it were. He's showing the uh, Apostle John the spiritual background of the persecution that the, ch- that the church is going through. And he describes the beast, the dragon, raising up two beasts, one from the earth and one from the sea. Listen to how the text reads, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Where is the dragon getting all this power and authority, by the way? How is this dragon able to work miracles? How is he able to control kingdoms? Where does he get crowns? Where does he get power when the Bible says that God raises up rulers and takes them down? We keep reading, verse 5. And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Who's allowing it? Who's allowing it to exercise authority for 42 months? Verse 6, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Who is giving them that permission? Making war against the saints, it is allowed. Do you notice the language of permission that pervades this part of the chapter? The beast is not doing this on its own. The dragon is not doing this on its own. Some other hand is at work as well. It was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. When were those names written in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain? Before the foundation of the... I know you thought that your name was written in the book of life. When you prayed that prayer, or when you jumped in that baptistry, or when you held up your hand, or whatever it is you think that you did. But the Bible says that the names of those who are saved, their names were written down in the book of the life, uh, the book of life, before the foundation of the world. And that means Paul's name was written there before he became a persecutor. Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword must he be slain. Do you realize that that has been foreordained? Uh, Whoever is appointed for captivity is going to go to captivity. Whoever is appointed for the sword is going to be slain by the sword. Here is the call for the endurance and faith of the saints. How do the saints find comfort in this? Satan's on a dog on a chain. That's all he is. He's a dog on a chain. God's holding the other end of the chain and he jerks him back and he buries him in a pit and he he can restrain him, he can loose him. He will allow certain things and we may say, why in the world would you allow saints to be persecuted? Why would you allow saints to be killed? And then two centuries later, Tertullian says the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's why Christianity took over the Roman Empire and then caused it to collapse. Verse 11, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Do you recognize that the Bible says that false teachers and false prophets will sometimes work signs and wonders and miracles? Well, how could they do that? Do they have the power of God? No, they don't have the power of God. But God allows them the power to do so in order to deceive. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. God will send them a strong delusion so that they may believe a lie and be lost. All those who did not love the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Who's giving the beast this power? Who's allowing this to be? 
Verse 15, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak, and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And here's the sad thing. People today love this chapter of the Bible, and they never seem to see what it's actually teaching us about God. We are fascinated with identifying who these beasts are and what that number means and how that's going to be worked out surely on the front pages of the newspaper today. Not then, but today. And do you recognize that embedded within that chapter of the Bible is an overwhelming demonstration of the sovereignty of God? And that the comfort that the church is receiving through this is the recognition that God has ordained everything. And God has appointed not only this period of persecution, but He's put an end to it. He's put a point on the end of it. And that time is coming. And God is in control. And you are not alone. You be faithful even to the point of death. Death has no power to hurt you at all. That's the comfort. That's the power. That's the encouragement. Now, I said we weren't going to get through everything. We haven't gotten through everything. We haven't even gotten through everything I thought we might get through tonight. We need to go to James chapter 1. And I told Randy this morning I was going here, and I really intended to get there. But we need to go to James chapter 1 and talk about then the implications for human responsibility and make sure that we're not thinking uh, incorrectly about the implications for God's character. But we're going to have to leave that there tonight. And hopefully that gives you a lot to meditate upon. I hope we've mentioned enough the pastoral and practical implications of this. If God is not sovereign, then even if He is God, you cannot trust that He is going to accomplish His purpose. But if God is not only in charge but in control, I don't want to say that you ought to live recklessly, but you can live without great care for your life because you know that you are safely in His hands. You can live with confidence and courage knowing that God is in control. That doesn't mean nothing bad is going to happen. But it does mean that every bad thing that ever happens is going to work together for God's glory and for the ultimate good of His people. That, that is truth that will allow us to be faithful even unto death. Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being who you are. For choosing to remain in control of all that you've made. You did not create and step away. And you are not powerless. You are not dependent upon circumstances. You are not dependent upon even our decision. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your love for your power, and for your eternal purpose. We pray, God, that you would bless the seed that is sown in our hearts, that it might bear fruit to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.